Hello, everybody. My name is Nicolina, and as my colleague said, today's presentation is all about validating the feasibility and the viability of product ideas before we spend some time and money making them. So when you read the word feasibility, uh, it, be, creating something that is feasible actually means that you, we can build it. And when it comes to the viability, it's all about the question, should we build it? So that's the main focus for today's presentation. Before we begin, I will tell you a little bit more about myself. I'm a principal product manager at Pega IT with a business analysis background. I'm actually an advanced certified Scrum product owner, and currently I'm on my path to becoming a certified Scrum professional. So far in my career, I really worked on dozens of different projects and products in various industries such as enterprise, insure tech, health tech, entertainment, I've created standalone applications. I worked on ERP, B2B, B2C products, tons of integrations. But my main focus was on building completely new products. So for today's agenda, we will briefly touch upon why generally products tend to fail. Then we will go through the basics of product discovery and why it's so important. We will talk about the hypothesis validation after that. This is actually the main act for today's presentation because hypothesis validation actually helps us with testing all of our ideas and assumptions that we might have. So we will go through the Lean Startup. We'll go through some examples of a real hypothesis that I've used or my mentor. We'll check the techniques that you can apply or use depending on where you are with your product, in which phase you are exactly. And we will talk about the prioritization and why it's so important to prioritize even the hypothesis that you have. And after that, we will summarize everything and of course leave some room for your questions. Okay, let's begin. So roughly three out of four products fail. Millions of startups around the globe are opened and closed in the first year of business. And you may think that maybe their idea was bad or the market that they were targeting for, was wrong, but it doesn't have to be the case. Usually, these companies have one thing in common. They don't validate their ideas before they invest the time and money into creating them. So where to start? Well, we talk about validating our ideas. What we do is we just start by taking our favorite idea, and then we run experiments to prove that idea will work. And we rarely decide how we'll act on the data that we collect. So basically what we're doing is called confirmation evidence. We just set ourselves to see up what we want to see and we never learn anything new. We're just constantly running in that confirmation evidence loop. We need to change this. To mitigate this risk and to mitigate the risk of creating a product that your people, your customers won't love, or that will make us run a sustainable business, we really need to learn how to validate or our, our ideas and test all of the assumptions that we have. And in order to do that, we should start with a proper product discovery. There are actually seven phases of product development and the most underrated phase is a product discovery phase. But I believe that this is the most important phase of any product. As you can see here, a product discovery is a method for deeply understanding your customers to develop products that perfectly suit their needs. So basically, this phase is the initiation phase. It's where a product manager talks to the customers, listens to their feedback, understands their pain problems, and of course, highlights gaps or assumptions in order to validate them. But if your customers don't exist, you should come up with a way to gather as much feedback as possible. And once you know which features are most valued to your customer, then the main goal is to obtain, to validate and implement customer feedback, constant loop, while making sure that you don't have any assumptions. And of course, product discovery, it's not a small thing. Many more things are done in it. But today I will just focus on the part of hypothesis validation and hypothesis testing, or generally testing your assumptions. You may wonder where to begin when it comes to product discovery. Well, first thing, you should really understand 
where you want to go with your product. What is your drive? What are you hoping to achieve? And why are you doing this in the first place? Because if you don't know where you're going, any road we got you there. That's why we start with a vision. If you have a rough idea, before you invest some time and money into creating this idea, even building an, an MVP, minimal viable product, you should write this idea down in some sort of a vision statement. It has to be clear enough and it has to be able to answer you the following questions. Who is it for? What you tend to provide? What are you actually building? What problem are you solving? And why do people need it? What makes it special? Why is somebody going to use your product? So basically, when you define a product vision, it represents a clear definition of success and you should define how you will know that you have achieved this success or not. This is your North Star. It will help you prioritize all of your hypotheses and make product decisions. So once you know what your vision is, you can actually begin to define and to validate your hypothesis. Because if you don't have a defined product vision, then you won't know if you have validated your hypothesis or not, uh, if you are building the right thing or not, if you're moving in the right direction with your product or not. And that's why creating some sort of a vision statement is really, really important before you invest some time and in, in money into building a product or a feature. So here on the right part of the screen, you can actually see the most used template that answers all of the questions on the left. You can see that uh, it's obvious who you are targeting. So who are your targeted customers? What are they currently dissatisfied with? What is your product? So the product essence statement on short description of your product. What are you providing to your customers? Unlike your competition, what, the, what are some key features that your product will have? And when you define your vision this way, you are actually mitigating the risks that I mentioned a couple of moments ago of just creating experiments to confirm that your big and shiny idea is going to work. Okay, so now we know that we need to test ideas. We know that the first part is a proper discovery. We need to have a vision. And after that, we can actually begin with the hypothesis validation. But you might be wondering, okay, but what is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a proposed explanation for a phenomenon that is falsable or testable. And when I say falsable, I mean that your hypothesis or your assumption can be examined through an experiment and it can be validated to be true or not true. If what is being proposed cannot be tested, it's not a hypothesis, it's just a guess. So any idea or a problem that you have has to be able you have to be able to break it down into a more concrete hypothesis. In these hypotheses, and generally the hypothesis testing, can help with answering the most important questions. Should this product or feature be built? And can we build a sustainable business based on this product or service? And this approach is generally used in Lean Startup. For those of you who don't know what Lean Startup is, Lean Startup is a methodology for developing businesses and products that generally aims to shorten the product development cycle and you want to rapidly discover if your proposed business model is viable or not. And this is actually achieved by adopting a combination of business hypothesis-driven experimentation and iterative product releases and, of course, continuous learning. So it's all about feedback, customer feedback over your own intuition. It's all about flexibility over planning. Basically, the goal of the Lean Startup is to help businesses find customers fast. So you want to do these small incremental tests to validate your assumptions and to validate your business idea. And you want to validate everything that you have, all the assumptions that you have about the product, customers, the market, maybe customer needs. So it's all about the famous build, measure, learn loop, although I prefer to look at it from the perspective of learn, build, measure, because sometimes you don't know, you won't know anything about your customers, or maybe you have a lot of assumptions. Therefore, I think that it's, that it's important to learn about them first, then build a product, an MVP or a prototype, then measure the feedback, learn from your data, and you can choose to preserve 
with the idea or with that hypothesis, meaning that you proved it, that it's okay and you can stick to the idea, or you can choose to pivot from it, meaning that you prove that hypothesis to be false and you have to completely change the hypothesis and start from a new idea. Okay, let's now see a real life example of a hypothesis for a completely new product that doesn't even exist. It's for my mentor, Carlton Nettleton from Applied Frameworks. And um, him and his business partner, Jason, they had an assumption that Scrum Masters and product owners are failing to convert to certified Scrum professional because there, there isn't any guidance. And they wanted to build an academy where they will actually create a product that will help Scrum Masters and product owners convert to CSP. And they wrote the, their assumption in a, in a uh, form of a hypothesis saying, Scrum Masters and product owners fail to convert to CSP, so Certified Scrum Professional, because they lack a complete certification program to guide them from their introductory certification to the higher certification levels, CSP and beyond. If you look at this hypothesis, if you're wondering if it's valid, I believe that it is. Because as you can see here, we have an observable behavior Scrum Masters and product owners are failing to convert to CSP. We are offering here a possible explanation, and this is actually testable. You can take this hypothesis, create the PowerPoint presentation or whatever it is that you want, go to the Scrum Masters and product owners and validate if they, this is actually true or it's not true. So this is an example of a rough idea is just written in a form of hypothesis, one hypothesis for the global idea, they can later be turned into a more refined hypothesis for the actual implementation of these ideas. Now, let's look at another example of a hypothesis for a product this, that exists. Here, you can see the most used template when it comes to hypothesis testing, because this template is really good. You can see here what is actually your assumption or what is the hypothesis that you want to validate or in, to prove that it's valid or not. You can see the experiment that you're going to create. So what are we going to do in order to test this hypothesis? We state the metric that we're going to use to measure the test. And we state up front what is the validation. How will we know if we are correct or not? When you write the hypothesis in this way, you're actually mitigating the risk of confirmation bias that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, if you remember, that people stick with their ideas and then just run some tests to prove that their idea is phenomenon and it's going to work. But if you put your ideas in this form, you can actually mitigate this risk because you have to think in advance about the metrics and the validation part. So that's how you can actually avoid the confirmation bias mode. So let's see an example if our academy, so for the previous slide that you saw, um, let's imagine that they already have a product and their visitors are not converting to trial accounts. And this is an example of how they would write their assumption in a form of a proper hypothesis. We believe the current content of the three trial page is not converting visitors to trial accounts because it is impersonal. To test the hypothesis, we will do split testing for 30 days of three, three trial pages, a page with improved copy, and a page with original copy plus the new hero picture. We're going to measure the number of new free trial accounts. We will be correct if we see a 5% increase in new trial accounts compared to the average number in the previous four months. So now that you look at it, it's very clear that you're guessing that the content of the three uh, trial page is bad, but you know exactly what are you going to build to validate your assumption and to test why your visitors are not converted to users. And you exactly as you can see here, you know exactly what is the validation. When will you know that you are correct or not? This is a proper hypothesis testing that can help you to mitigate the risk of actually building a completely new feature and later on proving that it's just not the case, that your, your visitors are not converting to trial accounts. Now for the part of the feasibility, 
here is an example how we can test the feasibility of a product that already exists. A proper hypothesis would say, we believe the current content management system, CMS, supports jumping from one page to another without losing any data that was in inserted and without the need to save each step. To test this, we're going to try to create a simple user flow with six pages. Each page will have a text box, drop down, and text area, and there will be a progress bar slash links so the user can jump between these pages. We're going to measure the possibility for the user to enter data and move between pages without saving and losing the data. Switching from one page to another must be in milliseconds. We will be correct if we see that the user can actually move along the pages and enter data, the data is not lost, and the application is fast. This is actually a real-life example of a product where I worked on. We could have started the development and late in the development find out that we can't build our most important feature, the one that's supposed to differentiate this product from the rest on the, on the market using this CMS, using that content management system. So to mitigate this risk, we chose to create a small proof of concept. Actually, we created a lot of them to validate the bunch of hypotheses that we had. And it turned out that the CMS just couldn't support this feature and many more. And we chose to pivot from that CMS to another. And that's why it's so important to test all of your assumptions that you have and to prove at the very beginning that your idea will actually work. And that's why the next slide about the evidence, I believe is really, really important. Because it's not just about creating a proof of concept to see if something is feasible, if it's viable uh, or not. It's also, it, the most important thing is the evidence that you gather from these hypotheses. They have to be able to tell you about customer interests, customer preferences, and their willingness to buy a product. To avoid the confirmation bias, you have to think about your evidence in a way that each piece of the evidence has to have a simple call to action. Because imagine if you run a test and your customers say they think it's valuable to them and you build it, you spend some time and money, and then later, out, later it turns out that they're not using it, then their actions are more important than their feedback. And that's why you have to think about the evidence that you're gathering, the validation part and the metrics. So you want to state up front what you believe that defines a successful experiment for you or not. So basically, this is the acceptance criteria of your hypothesis of that experiment. Sometimes you won't know it, and it's okay, because sometimes, especially if you're dealing with new technology, then you can run some, uh, you have some hypothesis, whatever, you can do something or not. And it's okay to say in the validation part, I'm just running some experiments to learn something, to gather some data. And that's okay. If you remember from our build, build measure loop, uh, learn loop, um, I said that sometimes you start from the learning part before you actually build something and then get the data. And when it comes to the metrics, the best metrics are those metrics that can easily be captured and are related to the hypothesis under the test. And of course, don't forget about the feasibility. I already mentioned, sometimes it's okay to state that you're just running an experiment to learn something, to test if it, if it can be done. But don't forget that you have to present everything that you're doing in some, sort of a, in some sort of a form of a proof of concept that is tangible. Everything that you do has to be tangible. Okay. So now that we know everything when it comes to the build, measure, learn cycle, how to write the proper hypothesis and about the evidence, Let's see some of the techniques that you can use depending on where you are with your product or with your idea. If you are at a very early phase, you must start with a collection of facts. But if you don't know these facts, you probably won't know how to write hypotheses. That's why you should start by learning something about your customers or about the problem or solution that you want to build and then build a prototype and then measure the feedback. So you can call this phase design and evaluation phase. Uh, what you want to do is to get insights into customer jobs, pains, gains. You want to learn something about maybe your product or other products about the market. Um, 
So I believe that this phase is all about finding if it's valuable to the users and if it's viable for you. And here are some techniques that you can use. Speedboat, product box, customer profile, prone the product tree, spider web, and many, many more. I'm not going to get into details right now for these techniques. I just wanted to highlight to you what you can use. Um, if you want to check them out, just Google innovation games and you will find tons of interesting gamifications that can be used uh, with your stakeholders and with your users throughout any phase of the product development. Next. Now, if you have a, already know what your idea is and you then the next step is what I call lab studies. So you want to gather insights into customers' behavior and their actions. So time, cost, and human resources are really needed here. But here, this is the part where you get concrete insights into their behavior, what is valuable for them, for them or not. Here, we can test a mock-up, a prototype, a feature, and we get that instant feedback. But don't create something too big, okay? Um, you don't want to spend a lot of money to prove that the next big feature is a big thing. Just create a wireframe or a PowerPoint sometimes. You just need something tangible uh, so that you get the feedback just like they're using a product. And of course, in this phase, avoid yes and no questions um, because the yes and no questions can't tell you anything about the viability uh, to the users. If you remember the uh, my mentor's example, um, they actually created a PowerPoint presentation. They didn't even create a design because when you hire a designer, it's, it's expensive. They actually created a PowerPoint presentation and they presented their idea to the Scrum Masters and product owners. And that's how they found out that actually end customers found, found their idea to be valuable. That's how they validated their hypothesis and that's how they actually started later on building the actual product. Of course, one, um, this phase lab studies is also all about the feasibility of your ideas, especially if you're facing many, many assumptions on how you're going to build this product. If you don't know anything about technology or you have to do some integrations that you've never done before, maybe you you're not even sure if it's possible to build a product in, in that way that you imagined or that feature, for example, if you have a lot of bad core system, you have no idea if you can integrate it with something else or something like that. What you can do in the lab studies phase, you can create some sort of proof of concept to validate the feasibility part. So you can state all of these item items as hypotheses, and then you can uh, run uh, cheap experiments, cheap proof of concepts to uh, test the feasibility. And as I mentioned, cheap so don't create a fancy UI, just test it, if it to see if it's going to work or to learn something from it. If it has value for your customers, if you can build it, the next question is, can you build a sustainable business? Will your customer, customers pay you to use your product? So here it's all about their buying decisions and their buying process. Some of the techniques that you can use are crowdfunding, pre-sales and mock sales. And you can also check their buying process by doing some split testing, Google ads, link tracking, landing pages. They can all help you uh, when you are, you know, supposed to make a big decision on what, what should you build next. If your big um, idea for the next feature is okay or not, these are some of the items that can help you. And finally, market analysis. Market research requires zero interaction with users. But we can learn about customer and market behavior that can really help us decide what we believe is valuable for them and to actually prove it that it is valuable for the users. So you can use government reports, third-party research, data from uh, customer relationship management, CRM, sales, analytics, social media, keyword searches, keyword trends. So basically all of these data sources can be used to learn more and get that much needed data before we begin with another build, measure, learn cycle. Okay, and finally, when we look at it all right now, you must be wondering, okay, where should I start first? What hypothesis should I do first? Well, I believe that you should prioritize hypothesis just like a product backlog. 
Well, when you look at it at one point, if you're not doing a hypothesis testing, then your product backlog is really an ordered list of hypotheses. So what I think you should do, you should organize them in some sort of a funnel. So at the very begin, at the very bottom of your funnel, are the number one items that you should do because these ones must be true to survive and thrive. These ones are your business killers. Therefore, they are at the very bottom. They are the ones that we are doing first because they can kill our business. It doesn't matter if they're cheap or not. We have to handle them first. Then we move to the speedy experiments that get us data from which we will gather actionable insights into customers' preferences. But remember, we should run them as cheaply and speedy as possible. So here we can learn something about the design choices, about the product, the market, the customers. So you can create some mockups, wireframes, PowerPoints, or when it comes to the technology, you can learn about it by creating some sort of proof of concept, or you can validate the feasibility by creating the proof of concept as well. And then the last, the very last part, we're leaving the hypotheses that are really expensive, but they will show us something about customer interests. And sometimes it's really worth investing in validating these hypotheses. So to summarize, we start with the business killers. Doesn't matter if they're cheap or not, they will kill our business, we're handling them first. Then we will handle the hypothesis that will tell us a little bit more about customer preferences. And at the very end, sometimes it's okay to invest some time and money into creating an experiments that are expensive, but they will tell us a little bit more about the customer interests. Okay, and to summarize, in order to build a good product before you invest some time and money, you should really start with why. What is your purpose? Then fall in love with problem and not the solution. Why am I saying this? Because I think that it's important that you identified what your goal is, what's your vision, and when it comes to how you're going to achieve the vision, you might pivot from the original idea and move to the next one, and it's okay. That's why you should fall in love with the problem and not the solution that you envision. Don't be afraid to think big with a vision and realize that any product is a leap of faith. Validate assumptions, because if you don't, they can cost you a lot of money. Create a list of hypotheses or these assumptions that you have. And depending on where you are with your product, choose the right technique for hypothesis validation. Prioritize, prioritize, prioritize. It's really important. And yeah, remember, don't make assumptions, validate them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nicolina. This, this was really product development 101. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was really in presentation. Uh, so do we have any questions for Nicolina now? Here we have one. Mm -hmm. Hypothesis validation used just in product discovery, or we can use it whenever we want. Well, you can use it whenever you want, but um, generally people tend to, product managers use it mostly in the product discovery phase before you actually move to the development. But if you read and if you follow Teresa Torres, she speaks a lot about continuous discovery approach, meaning that you, even when you move into development, you're de developing new features and everything, you should implement the hypothesis validation. You should continuously discover about your product, about the market, and whatever is something is feasible or not. So I believe you should do it constantly. Let's say it like that. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolina. Everybody's saying that you had a great presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are you coming today to the event? Or no, you... unfortunately, I'm not in SAD. That's yeah. why I can't. Um... Me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we okay. have one more. Which okay. implementation techniques are uh, are you using most frequently? Oh, it depends. Um, it really depends. Um, if if we're talking about the very early stage, um, I like the product box. I use that technique. Um, prune the product tree I think is amazing although I never personally used it there is now a potential a potential pro uh, product where we can use the technique I personally love it never use it but yeah I would say the product box is something that I tend to use when it comes to design phase when it comes to the other phases I don't know pre-sales and mock sales are something that's quite uh, that I use quite often 
Mm. Google Ads, some of these things, yeah. CRM, of course. Hi, Nicolina, I have a question. Hi. I will ask you like this. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm also in Avisad and we are going to Belgrade by car, so you can jump in if you like. Okay, uh, didn't know that. Uh, okay, and my question is, do you have some real example of your hypothesis? Uh, maybe the first hypothesis was that you didn't have many uh, trial subscriptions, mm -hmm. and then you improve the page. And do you maybe have some real examples? If you don't have now, maybe you can uh, supply later on, on on our community page so we can see how you improve the product and attract your users okay. to subscribe to the product. Okay, I don't have an example right now, but sure, I can send you an example so you can see it. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome.